essential affirmations of biblical Christology. Don't read them to me. Show me you've actually learned them by now, and they're already in your creed, hopefully, well on your way to getting your creed, creed on Christ done. Um, what's the first essential affirmation of biblical Christology? Aurora? Um, he was fully and divine. Okay, Jesus is fully and completely divine. Exactly. Jesus is fully and completely divine. Second affirmation? Jesus is fully and completely human. Good, Bethany. Third affirmation, somebody besides those two stars. Third affirmation. Miranda? Um, oh, that's four. Go to three. Oh, uh, How can you have unity unless you have the first one? I mean the third one. Yeah, who what are give me a good sentence, Miranda. That's both of them, but, but you're, good job. Yes, yeah, so the natures of Christ are distinct. Good, beautiful. Now four, then, is what? Somebody else? Give me a good, complete sentence. What's unified? His divine nature and human nature are unified. How? Anybody? How are they unified? In one person. Beautiful. His divine and human natures are completely united in one person. Okay, good, that's teamwork. Those are the four essential affirmations. Now, we'll call that biblical Christology. That's what we've seen. We haven't gotten humanity yet, but we've seen Jesus is fully and completely divine, uh, and, and then we're going to unpack these. We've now laid the biblical basis for deity. We, we laid that on the table as, as, as well as we could in the last couple weeks. Uh, Jesus is fully and completely divine. All the fullness of deity dwells in him in bodily form. Um, he was with God and was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, he's the exact imprint of God's nature. Uh, he uh, is, is fully and completely God. We've seen that over and over again. Now, in the history of the church, there's been no more important issue than this one in getting it right. There's no more important question of life, as we saw last time. Uh, but we have our greatest errors, then, in light of this question. And getting the answer to this question, who is Jesus, who do you say that I am, is of utmost importance. There's nothing more important in all of life. So, so we have this biblical Christology. In the history of the church, there are a few ways we've primarily gotten this wrong. Uh, the first, an early heresy called Ebionidism. We're on page 91 in your notes, right? Ebionidism is a view of Christ where these Jewish um, folks who are, are considering Jesus as the Messiah, who actually thought Jesus was the Messiah, but could not handle the fact that he was God. And so they had this view of Jesus' Messiahship as uh, the power of God coming upon him for his ministry. This view could also be called something like adoptionism, that he was the son of God, but God adopted him as the son and endowed him with power to be Messiah, to fulfill messianic identity, but he wasn't God. So, so the Ebionites, the poor ones, literally, is what that means. That might mean they had poor theology. It might mean they were a poor sect of people. But, but this was the first um, radical denial of the deity of Christ. So held to a messiahship, even held to a son of God idea, but uh, rejected his deity. That's Ebionitism. That's about all I want to say about it. Early, never really got formally um, put in documents and made official or anything like that, but we, just, we do know that this early sect of, of Jews uh, came up with a messiah that wasn't divine, but although it was Jesus. And so what they ended up having to do then is reject uh, major portions of the, the, the Bible, like every, all of it except for portions of Matthew, which was written in a Jewish audience. And, and they, so they, they maintained portions of that, but not the portions that, that would teach that Jesus is fully God. So the Ebionites rejected the deity of Christ, early heresy that go after this first affirmation. Yes? Okay. Then, you're a believer in the third century, and you have one creed, and this is what it is. It's the Apostles' Creed. 
This is your summary statement of your belief. So let's stand and recite it together. Oh, it's a hassle to do that. You can sit if you need to. This is so much work. All right, here we go. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day, He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. That's it. That's your creed. By quick and the dead, it doesn't mean people who have fast twitch muscle fibers, but people um, who are alive, both those who are living and those who have died in the resurrection. Catholic church with a small c means what? What is Catholic? Universal. Good. Um, the community of the saints. Good. So that's your creed. That's your statement. And that's really all you felt a need for because it summarizes basic Christian belief. But then a really brilliant, really persuasive teacher comes along and uses the Bible to teach some other things. Um, right. Am I just making this up? Was there no, it's in, the, it's in some <laughs> versions. About why it doesn't say Jesus descended into to hell? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Grudem, yeah, Grudem has written probably the best commentary in 1st and 2nd Peter, and that's where the key passage for that discussion comes from. That's why Grudem has a massive section in his systematic theology in, under the atonement on whether or not Jesus descended into hell. And he shows in this massive chart that the earliest versions of the creed don't have that, and it's actually probably an inaccurate teaching that Jesus somehow literally descended into hell that came out of an emphasis on the ransom theory of the atonement where Jesus had to pay a ransom by giving himself to Satan in a hell sort of situation and he burst out of hell and said, aha, you thought you had me, but you don't. And, and so it just over, overplays the ransom theory and, and incorporates the descent into hell into that. Um, it, it's, a, it's a teaching that got in later versions of the creed that isn't really based on solid biblical evidence. So some people, people still believe it. And probably the most used versions of the creed have the descent into hell, but, but I don't think the best one does. Okay, and the earliest one doesn't. Uh, so, so here it is, and you've got your statement. But then a really persuasive, really brilliant teacher is using the Bible to teach things like this. He's saying things like this. There was a time when Jesus was not. Each member of the Godhead is of a different substance. Now hear essence or nature when you hear substance. He's saying the Father alone is the eternal God, or the Son is the first and greatest of created beings. He's saying the persons of the Trinity have three distinct natures. And now you're wondering if the Apostles' Creed is enough. Because this persuasive, brilliant teacher is teaching these things, and you know, he's teaching these things and he's affirming everything in the Apostles' Creed at the same time. Everything in here, he affirms. Because if you notice, this doesn't say anything that has a problem with anything that's being said here. And so these influential teachings now require a clarification. We, we've got to figure out what we think. So the bottom line question we're asking here is, is when, when we affirm this part of the creed, Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, doesn't go into much detail on what we mean by Jesus or Christ or Son or Lord. So that's still open to interpretation when you say the Apostles' Creed. And until someone comes along and starts teaching things like this, you don't feel the need for refinement and clarification, but now you do. And that's what you have to do, and that's exactly what the church did. They had to refine, they had to clarify, they had to amend the Apostles' Creed, basically, and speak to the teachings of, of this idea of Jesus. 
And that's exactly what I want you guys to do right now. In your cohort groups, I want you to make an amendment to the Apostles' Creed. Because the church is going to gather from around the world, sending representatives of the church in your area to a council in Nicaea and decide what the church believes about these teachings. So, you are no longer 21st century Christians sitting in La Mirada. You are now believers in the 4th century trying to figure out what you think about these teachings. So, cohort captains, raise your hands. Sean, you are no longer Sean cohort captain. You are Sean, Bishop Sean, Bishop of Nicaea. Okay, you are Bishop Katie, uh, Bishop of Constantinople. I just feel like that'd be a good place for you to be from. Who else? <laughs> where, where are the other captains? All right. Yes, now we are no longer co captains. We are bishops, and we are from places like Rome and Jerusalem and Nicaea and Carthage, and we have to hammer out in our churches what we believe about these teachings, and then we're coming to a council. Oh, Bishop Sean is going to host us in Nicaea. Get the finger foods ready, Sean. We're coming. Um, and we're going to decide what we believe about Christ. Yes? Do you understand what I want? What I want is, what I want is an amendment to the Apostles' Creed. Just a few sentences, a few <laughs> concise sentences that uh, you don't have to give all sorts of Scripture references like you will in your creed, but I want you to make a few statements responding to these teachings and basically make an amendment to the Apostles' Creed. Look at these teachings, look at these sentences as a group, as a church, and say, what do we think about this? Do we have a problem with this? And if you do, what's the problem? And then make statements that speak to your issues with these sentences. Yes, you clear what I want? Just, just a, a brief amendment to the Apostles' Creed to respond to Arian teaching. Yes? Everybody know what I want? All right, go ahead. Do theology. Do Okay, let's regroup. I am so eager to hear what you came up with. This was such an important exercise. I wanted you to experience and feel this. Because, guys, the church really did this. This really happened. Um, the church was reciting the Apostles' Creed when they worshipped, and then a guy by the name of... Who taught this stuff? Arius, good. Arius came teaching these things very persuasively, focusing on passages of the Bible that said things like, uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Um, no, I'm sorry, focusing on passages that say things like, the Father is greater than I. Uh, what do you do with those? Uh, Arius came along teaching these things. He taught about, it talked about this idea of being begotten. There seems to be this, this uh, dependence that the Son has on the Father. So what do we do with that? And Arius taught brilliantly from the Bible uh, and very rationally oriented and it required a response. And the church did this. They, they gathered and they responded to these teachings based on their concerns about what it meant for Jesus. So I'm so eager to hear what you guys came up with. What did you come up with? Let me hear it. Group one, where are you? Group one. Good. Hey, let me ask you something. How do you think you would have done on this if I asked you to do it first day of class in January? Not great. Not great, no. I think you would have looked at these teachings of Arius and said, ooh, it's not something right about that. Uh, okay. But what did you just do? In 10 minutes, you whipped out your theological laser beam and you zeroed in on the core issues. You know, the church, one of the worst things is that we get all flailing around in the smoke instead of going right after the fire, instead of realizing what are the core issues here. There's a lot we could talk about and think about, but what are the fundamental issues we need to address here? And you guys did that like <laughs> thing of beauty. And then you spoke to those issues in clear, concise, deep statements that addressed them. Arius can't sign your doctrinal statement anymore. Um, you spoke to those issues. Can we just enjoy this for a moment? Can we just pause and enjoy this? Have a moment of silence for the theological growth you've all experienced in beautiful ways. You just 
were put in the place of church leadership and responded beautifully and so clearly in your statements. Did you hear your statements? They were tight and clear. There wasn't like, 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 like. <laughs> You know, it's like, well, like, like, no, none of that. It was just getting right after it. You know, you know, they were like, you know, really good and clear, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were great guys. I, I please just have a little appreciation for yourselves. You really need to say, oh, Lord, I am really growing as a theologian here. Uh, not pridefully, but say, yes, I want you to be so confident that you have had some great theological equipping going on here where you can respond to these sorts of things. Now, you're in the back of your minds, you've got all the development of the church going on that helps you do that. But what a beautiful example of how much you guys are growing and learning together. It's just fantastic. Here, I'm telling you the truth. When I hear you make statements like you just did, Here's the feeling I get. If I died today, that's just fine. I really do feel like that. I feel like, you know what? If I was riding my bike home like I will this evening and get crushed by a truck, that's fine. The church is in good hands. We're going to be fine. I, I honestly feel that way. I feel like then we're good. We're good to go. They're set. That's how I feel. I do. It's so moving for me. I just love it. I love to hear that kind of growth you guys are experiencing. So let's enjoy that. And let's re also enjoy having just walked in the sandals of, of third century believers. That's really happened. End of the third century, early fourth century. We've got this development of a, a, a statement on Christ that needed to be developed. You know, until you have false teaching, you don't tend to clarify your initial teaching. And that's exactly what happened. The church had to come together and formulate what it believed. And it, and it did that in the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD as churches formulated their understanding, came together from, from all over uh, the world and they established what they thought. And it became a debate between these three views that are there in your notes. Athanasius was the champion of the idea that Jesus knows us of the same essence. He looked at passages like, like Jesus uh, is the exact imprint of the nature of God and in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And he's the creator God who uh, was with God and was God and, became, and, and, uh, and came, became flesh and dwelt among us. And, and he realized the implications of this. He realized the necessity of this for worship. And he debated Arius, who believed that Jesus had a different essence from the Father. This homoousios is this key word. Homoousios, the same essence. Or Arius saying, no, he's of a different essence. Heterousios, you know, uh, homogeneous means sameness, and heterogeneous means we difference. And he said, no, a different substance. Well, Arius eventually won the day. But then another group emerges called the Semi-Arians who say, okay, maybe he's not a different essence, but he's not fully God in the same way the Father is. And so uh, he's, he's homoousios, uh, a similar essence. Not different maybe, but, but not the same. So, so different. And the church has this debate and, and hammers this out and figures out what they believe. And uh, they came up with a creed in response to it, which basically amends the Apostles' Creed and does exactly what you guys just experienced. That's what I love. Well, I love that you just got to, to have a sense of what that must have been like. You want to see what they came up with? I actually have it right here on this page down here. You want to see it? Here we go. Look how I am so high tech. Here we go. Look, here's the Nicene Creed. Look what they came up with. You're going to hear this with such understanding now. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Sounds just like the Apostles' Creed, right? And of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, still have no disagreement with Arianism, but here we go, watch. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance, homoousios, with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, who was incarnated by the Holy Spirit, and then it picks it up and keeps going. Do you see that statement, that, that definition of who it is 
we mean by Lord Jesus Christ is so important. And you can hear, oh, okay, that's going right after Arian teaching. Arius can't sign this creed anymore because he doesn't agree with that definition of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this refinement had to happen. And I love that you guys were handed that assignment and, and did beautifully. You got right at the key issues and spoke to it concisely. And the Nicene Creed does just that. It speaks to these issues in a powerful and clear way and helps us understand who Jesus is. Now, many of your statements were anticipating future issues. You were saying, let's just get the Trinity right on the table and then we can alleviate two more councils, which is exactly what would have happened if you had been in the, in the mix. Now you're standing on their shoulders, but yeah. So they came up with this creed and it speaks to it. Now, I, I love this, but let me ask you something. Um, what's the big deal? Uh, I mean, especially when you get to this level, is he, uh, the same essence or a similar essence. Wait, you're telling me that you're having a big old debate and you're even kicking people out of your church over one letter. <laughs> the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet. How ironic. And this sort of thing actually becomes a great source of disdain that people have toward Christians. See, that's the problem with Christianity. You, you get this whole, whole uh, view of truth and, and life and, and doctrine where it's so important that you, you end up kicking people out of the church so much for unity. You have a debate over one letter. And as a matter of fact, it's this, what, you know what letter this is? An Iota, right. One, one letter, the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet becomes an issue of contention. I unbelieve how nitpicky you theologians can be. One letter. Hey, did you ever hear anybody use the expression? I don't give one iota what you think. Ever anybody say that? They don't know it, but they're unwittingly referring to the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD when they make that statement. <laughs> they are. That's, that's why that became a phrase people use. I don't give one iota what you think. I don't, I don't even care about the, the least bit about what you say. The smallest little puny letter of the alphabet, I'm, I don't give regard to what you're saying. So why? Why would you make an issue out of it? You get together in your little groups, you come up with your little statements, and you say, you can't be in our church. That sounds very unloving and bigoted to me. You think you got all the answers. You think this is so important. What's the big deal, really? Come on. Uh, even between a different ends, he says Jesus died for our sins. He says he rose from the dead. He says he's coming back. He believes in the second coming. He believes he's the son of God. But that's not good enough for you. Why not? Talk to me. Why is that an issue? So. Oh, wow. How does that happen? Now, whatever, propitiation, yes. Uh, yeah, what if we said, we said that the work of Christ is a direct result of what? The person of Christ. Who he is enables what he does. It's got massive implications for things like the atonement, but other things too. Look in your notes. Practical implications for the deity of Christ. And look, let's, because we're going here, let's not say, well, Jesus is this way because he had to be so he could save us. No, because of who he is, he was able to save us how he does. He doesn't become fully God so that he can save us. He's fully God so he can. And he does. But what do we lose if we don't have a fully divine Christ? We lose real knowledge of God. We lose revelation. John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God. The only God who's at the Father's side, he has made him known. John 14, 9, Jesus says, Have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus brings us the same divine nature as the Father in the Son who became a man, so we have revelation of God. And as it's been said, through God alone can God be known. We, as Marcella was just saying, lose redemption. We not just lose revelation of God, we lose redemption by God. 
The reason Jesus can be the one mediator between God and man is because he is God and man. He has to be. He has to be God to be able to die for our sins. Who's dying on that cross is a huge question. Can he atone for the sins of the world, this offense against an infinite God? Can he do that? What else do we lose? We lose a powerful high priest. It's one thing to say Jesus is human and so he understands our weakness, our suffering, our struggles, our temptations. But the second question then has to become, can this sympathetic high priest do anything about our weakness, our struggles, our temptations? Does he have the, the all-powerful nature, the all-wise nature, the all-loving nature to be able to actually overcome these weaknesses he's so sympathetic toward? And we find out that our sympathetic high priest does have everything he needs to meet our needs. That's why Anselm says only man should die for sin. Only God can take that on. And Jesus accomplishes both. What should happen as a human taking on our, our penalty and as God has to if it's going to be a, a sufficient atonement. Uh, Hebrews 4, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has in every respect been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And finally, worship of Jesus and obedience to Jesus is appropriate and necessary. That's one of the big issues Athanasius challenged uh, Arius with. Because Arius actually encouraged Jesus worship. And Athanasius said, you're encouraging worship of someone who's not God. Not fully God, and that's blasphemy. Uh, and, and, but if Jesus is God, we should worship him the way we do, and he does deserve ultimate obedience. Philippians 2, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at, at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. These are massive implications. If Jesus isn't fully God, we lose everything. We lose revelation of God as we have it in Christ. We lose redemption by God if we have it, as we have it in Christ. We lose a sympathetic high priest who can meet our needs, and we lose the true worship and obedience to Jesus that we have. So we lose everything. We lose the ranch if Jesus isn't God. It's got massive implications. Guys, there's no coincidence that any group that denies the full deity of Christ ends up working for their salvation. Jehovah's Witnesses are modern-day Arians, and they have a work salvation. Because if Jesus isn't God, he can't really take on the sins of the world the way he does. Uh, now, I, I want us to think briefly about not only the implications our discussion has had for Christology, but for just our idea about truth in general. Think about this church who invests all this time and seeks to come up and believes they come up with a definitive statement for the people of God. Think about the view of truth you have to have for that. Guys, I am so deeply concerned about the spirit of the age today, so influenced by a culture who doesn't believe in truth, that the church is trying to adapt and conform in the name of relevance to speak into that culture to the point where we become as in love with ambiguity as the culture is. And the most cutting edge and cool and hip and trendy versions of the church are very vague and cloudy and fuzzy and ambiguous and love ambiguity. Now there are some things that are unclear in Scripture. There are some things that don't deserve uh, intense conviction, but there is plenty that does. And most certainly what we believe about Christ, who He is, deserves the utmost intensity and conviction and commitment and belief. And God has not minced words on these things. Yet we're learning to think and talk in a way that would lead us to the point we're thinking about having a council to discuss the fine nuances of these issues as absurd. And I, I listen to some of the leading uh, uh, voices in the church today and it's just so confusing. Listen to one who was interviewed not too long ago. He was asked these questions, a very influential leader of what we call the emergent church or the, the progressive evangelicalism, the, the post-Christian, post-modern, post-propositional, uh, uh, post-evangelical, cool, emergent, hip, trendy, who have the coolest glasses and skinny jeans you can wear. So, um, here we go. 
who have chapters in their books like, this is not your grandmother's Christianity. As if that would be so bad. Um, ask these, listen, but just listen to the way of talking. This is what I want you to hear. Um, here's a question. Do you believe the Bible contains the objective truth of the gospel and that this truth must be known and believed in order for someone to be saved? Does the Bible have objective truth of the gospel and does this objective truth need to be believed in order for someone to be saved? Here's the answer. Listen, I don't like to use the word objective. It's not a biblical word. Neither is Trinity, neither is incarnation. Where do we, yeah, so that's a different issue. But I, I he says, I also find the word known problematic. Without knowing how you mean no, I wouldn't know how to answer. And then listen to this, I believe people are saved not by objective truth, but by Jesus. Now what are you hearing? How would you describe what you're hearing? Contradiction, Contradiction but they're called false dichotomies. As if you can even have a, a, a salvation by Jesus that doesn't have objective truth with it. Uh, he goes on. Their faith isn't in their knowledge, but in God. Doesn't there have to be a knowledge component to faith? Uh, I believe the Bible can make us wise to salvation. I hope that helps. No, it doesn't help at all. It makes it very confusing. Um, another question. Do you believe a born-again Christian can be certain about his or her eternal destiny? Do you believe a born-again Christian can be certain about his or her eternal destiny? Answer, yes. And I said, oh, great, until I read the next sentence. I also believe that a born-again Christian can be wrong. So their confidence should not be in their certainty, but in the grace of God. I wonder if he's certain about that. <laughs> Do you see how we've learned to talk, how we're learning, being taught to talk? In ways that leave people saying, huh? One, one of these really influential leaders was asked last year to tweet the gospel, 140 characters. Give me the gospel in 140 characters. Here's what he put. He said, I would, I would say, here's the gospel. Here's how I define the gospel in, on, on a Twitter tweet, whatever. I would say that history's headed somewhere. The thousands of little ways in which you're tempted to believe that hope might actually be a legitimate response to the insanity of the world actually can be trusted. And the Christian story is that a tomb is empty and a movement has actually begun that has been present in a sense all along in creation. And all those times when your cynicism was at odds with an impulse within you that said that this little thing might be about something bigger, those tiny little slivers may in fact be connected to something really, really big. That's the gospel? This guy is hugely influential. Massive church, highly published. That's the gospel? It sounds cool and thoughtful and creative, but is that the gospel? Paul said what? I passed on to you what was of first importance, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, was buried and rose on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And I don't hear that here. We live in a, a time where it's cool to be unclear. Listen to J. Gresham Machen in the 20s when he was teaching at Princeton what he said. He said, the temper of mind today is hostile to precise definitions. Indeed, nothing makes a man more unpopular in the controversies of the present day than an insistence upon definition of terms. Men discourse very eloquently today about sub -su such subjects as God, religion, Christianity, atonement, redemption, faith, but are generally incensed when they're asked to tell in simple language what they mean by these terms. John Piper wrote a little biography on Athanasius, our hero here who almost gave, had to give his life for what he was believing here. And he writes this, in light of this, this view of truth that is so increasingly influential in the church. Listen to what Piper says. He says, what was clear to Athanasius was that propositions, you know a proposition is a statement, the kind of statements you write in your creeds. I'm, I'm having you write propositions telling me and others what you believe about God, Christ, and humanity. And he says, what was clear to Athanasius was that propositions about Christ carried convictions that could send you to heaven or hell. 
there were propositions like there was a time when the Son of God was not. And He was not before He was made. And the Son of God is created. These propositions were strictly damnable. If they were spread and believed, they would damn the souls which embraced them. And therefore, Athanasius labored with all his might to formulate propositions that would conform to reality and lead the soul to faith and worship in heaven. He goes on, I believe Athanasius would have abominated with tears the contemporary call for depropositionalizing that you hear among the many so-called reformists and emerging church, younger evangelicals, post-fundamentalists, post-foundationalists, post-prepropositionalists, and post-evangelicals. I think he would have said, our young people in Alexandria die for the truth of propositions about Christ. What do your young people die for? And if the answer came back, we die for Christ, not propositions about Christ, I think he would have said, that's what Arius says. So which Christ will you die for? Athanasius would have grieved over sentences like this, and these are right out of the books of these kinds of leaders. Athanasius would have grieved over sentences like, it is Christ who unites us, it is doctrine that divides. Have you heard people talk like this? And sentences like, we should ask, whom do you trust rather than what do you believe? Hear all these false dichotomies? He would have grieved because he knew that this is the very tactic used by the Arian bishops to cover the councils with fog so that the word Christ could mean anything. Those who talk like this, Christ unites, doctrine divides, have simply replaced propositions with a word. They think they've done something profound and fresh when in fact they've done something very old and stale and very deadly. It sounds so cool and sublime and creative and new and fresh and post everything, but it's, it's nothing but the kind of confusion that leads us astray from the truth that brings clarity to life. All these false dichotomies that it's not about what you believe, it's about who you believe. Do you realize what a false dichotomy that is? It's no wonder to me D.A. Carson wrote a book about all these current trends. And his major conclusion on all of this, this emergent stuff is damn all these false dichotomies to hell. You can't have a relationship with Christ without belief in Christ. You can't talk about Christ without propositions about Christ. It sounds cool and hip and trendy and creative and new and fresh, but it's, any, it's nothing of the sort. It's, it's so deeply problematic and it leads us away from the kind of faith that led people to go to their deaths for what they believed. Will we be able to look the martyrs in the eye one day based on how we lived our lives according to the truth? People died for this stuff. People died for the things we talk about in this class. They died for them. They gave their blood for these things. Lots of people. Today in China, people are dying for these things. And yet we can approach it as this interesting, fun exercise instead of matters of heaven and hell and life and death. And, and it's all about the process and never arriving anywhere. As soon as you arrive somewhere, people are skeptical. It's not cool to be nothing but a journeyer, never arriving anywhere. Boy, it seems like every other church these days has the name journey in it somewhere. As if it's, it's nothing but journey and no arrival. No, we, we, we base the entire journey on having arrived at some very fundamental truths that we're willing to live and even die for. Let me pray. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.